alcoholism generally has two different components, right? People who are alcoholics have two different things, qualifications, if you will. One is when they start drinking, they can't stop. And then the other side of it, so that's one sort of way that we're alcoholics. And then the other one is when we try to stop, we can't. The spiritual awakening really came for me once I once I stopped running and hiding and and took off those masks that I had spent my whole life trying to be something that I wasn't and finally being willing to say, who am I and how do I want to show up in the world? In, in personal brand, especially in personal branding, right? We're the face of our brand, which is most of the people that I work with. It's very, we think we have to be a certain thing because we're too scared to be who we really are. You get to choose what you put out there, but it, it means you, you are who you are, right? Yeah. Giving yourself the grace to try things, to fail at it, and then go do something else and not feel like you have to come out of the gate being perfect and that you have to be somebody that you're not. Because the more that you are yourself, the better your sales are going to do, which is always so weird to people, but it's totally true. So I want to welcome everybody back to another episode of Soul Inspired. Today, I have Sherry Sutton with us. She has had a spiritual type experience after sobriety, and she also is now a marketing specialist and amongst other things. So we'll talk about that. But thanks so much, Sherry, for joining us today. Really appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you for having me. I love the work that you're doing on this podcast and honored to be here. I feel like before we talked, I just did a really quick <laughs> I talk really fast because I don't want to get to know too much about you. I want it to be on the fly and, you know, in the actual experience of the episode. So that's why I do that. So I really appreciate your patience with that. And uh, one of the one of the first things I start with, if we can go back to that moment. So if there's a moment in your life where you really saw a change happen, you know, like, I don't know who you were before that. Sometimes I ask people to paint a little bit of a picture of who you were before when this change in your life happened or experience or where you see a shift happening and how that happened. Yeah, thank you. For me, it was during the process of getting sober. So I had spent my whole life always just feeling a little awkward, right? Feeling a little left of center. I never really felt like I fit in. And I always tried to do whatever I needed to do to make everyone around me like me, whether it was something that served me or not. So I had spent my life being a chameleon in service of the fear that you weren't going to like me, right? That I was, that I was somehow broken, that I was somehow a little, a little left of center. And I had spent my whole life doing that spent a little bit of time as an entrepreneur at one point after 20 years in the corporate world and really kind of started figuring out who I was. But when you go through that process, it can be very painful. And so I found myself at one point completely addicted to alcohol. I had gone through a really traumatic divorce. Um, my ex-husband just wasn't really thrilled, frankly, with the person that I was becoming. Um, and when I was sort of finding who I who I was, because I'd sold him the corporate girl, right? I had sold him the idea of this other person. And as I wanted to find who I was, I realized that that wasn't who I was, and so did he. So painful divorce. My mom passed away. I have a small child. We moved across the country thinking that was going to fix the marriage. Uh, which it didn't. And I found myself with no business because I had left my business on the other side of the country in a brand new city, newly divorced, no job. Thank God I still had my son. And I just looked for solace at the bottom of a bottle, right? And I, after about a year of being really, really heavy drinking, really bad decision making as anyone who's drinking dusk till dawn uh, or dawn to dusk uh, will tell you making a lot of really bad decisions. I found myself like, I can't, I just can't do this anymore. I just can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm too old for this. I'm too old to be blacking out and passing out 
on, you know, the corner in, you know, downtown Dallas, not knowing where I am, not knowing how I got there. Wow. And I finally decided to get sober. My life was really saved by a Facebook post by a somewhat kind of random person who I knew I was a photographer and had done a, a couple of shoots, you know, one shoot for her. And she posted on Facebook that she was 90 days sober. And I saw that on the day after I had had a really bad drunk. And we could talk about any of this stuff in more detail if you'd like. And I wrote to her and said, what do I do? And she said, here's what you do. And gave me some tips and gave me a group to go to that was right down the street. And I've been sober ever since. And that's really, you know, we talk about sort of that's the bottom, but then the spiritual awakening kind of comes from that. And so I'll, I'll stop for a second so you can ask any questions you might want to, but the spiritual awakening really came for me once I, once I stopped running and hiding and, and took off those masks that I had spent my whole life trying to be something that I wasn't and finally being willing to say, who am I? And how do I want to show up in the world? No, I, pre I appreciate you telling the story, just even just a little quick overview of what was going on in your life. And I'm sorry you went through what you went through. It sounds like you had a bunch of things happening at once, and that doesn't help someone, especially if someone has any type of addiction, any type of substance. Usually the substance addiction happens because of, of something pretty deep. So it's already... This is where I think a lot of people, I'd say I grew up with an alcoholic father. He's passed since, but I think a lot of people don't understand that a lot of times with any type of substance abuse, it's, it's, it's a, it's a slow grow. It's not like one day you just wake up and you're like, Hey, I'm going to become an alcoholic. It's like you, you, you use it to cope and you get by a few days and then Maybe you do it once a week, then it's like, okay, now I need it more because I'm not really happy. And you don't even know you're not happy, but you're doing this, right? And this is what happens. And then before you know it, it's like brushing your teeth. It's it's like, this is what I do, you know? And yeah. somehow, somewhere along the line, some people are able to acknowledge that's going on and other people don't. And they end up like my father did where they, you know, they don't end up surviving very long. So- my first question to you is if if you can if you can answer this, I think you can. It might be difficult. Um, but before we get into what happened spiritually, and maybe it ties into that actually, the question is and how does someone who's in that place find it within them to know they need help? Or did you know you needed help the whole time? But you just acknowledge it. And this is where that's where I'm I'm always questioning that. Like, how do you yeah, you've seen a Facebook post, right? But you could put that Facebook post in front of another hundred addicts and they may not have the others the same, you know, decision making that you did at the time. I'm wondering if you can dig into that a bit further. Yeah. And I think it's not even just that moment. It's whether or not you're gonna choose to have the willingness, not only that day, but every single day after that to stay clean and sober. Because it's it's easy, it's not easy to get sober, it's hard to get sober, it's easier to stay sober. But I see so many people struggling with staying sober, with keeping that willingness to continue to be radically honest, right? Mm -hmm. And radically responsible for their own lives and their own and their own behavior. And I wanted to comment on one other thing you said because I think mm -hmm. there's maybe some education we can do about alcoholism in particular here. Sure. So, alcoholism generally has two different components, right? People who are alcoholics have two different things, qualifications, if you will. One is when they start drinking, they can't stop. And that is something that's very common among alcoholics in recovery. They say that, I mean, and I can say this from an early age, right? From, from high school, from even before, you know, before where if I had one, I had to have 10, right? If I had one, the allergy was on and I was going and I wasn't going to stop until it was done. And there is a, there's like a chemical change in us that other 
people don't have. And the only way that I can explain it to people who haven't gone through it is, um, so Joe, tell me, what's your favorite snack? Uh, it's a really weird one, actually. Okay. <laughs> Give I it like, to me. I like toast with some uh, tahini. Okay. Love tahini. Mm. All right. So I'm going to make you the best, the best bread, best tahini you've ever had. Right. I'm going to put it in front of you. You get one bite and then you have to put it back down and you're not allowed to touch it mm -hmm. for the rest of the day but you have to sit there and stare at it. And that's what it's like to be an alcoholic. You have one bite and you can't resist, right? Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, it's potato. It's either potato chips or M&Ms. That's the analogy. I know, I mine's a bit healthier right? than the average. Everyone's like, I know. toast and that tahini. Was... What's wrong with this guy? But yeah, everybody, you're right. I'm a little disappointed in you, Joe. Yeah. I gotta <laughs> say. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But yeah. for a lot of people, yeah. It's like, so I explained, like you have a bowl of M&Ms in front of you or a bowl of, of potato chips in front of you. And you can have one and that's it. And then you have to walk away, right? You can't have one potato chip because you have one and your body's like, Ooh, give me more salt. Give me more, you know, one M&M, give me more sugar. And that's one of the precursors of being an alcoholic. And that's the thing that people who don't have it can't understand. They're like, why can't you just walk away from the bowl of potato mm -hmm. chips? And they're like, I just can't. It, it like sets off a chemical in my brain. And this is, you know, proven that for, that tells me I need more no matter what. And then the other side of it. So that's one sort of way that we're alcoholics. And then the other one is when we try to stop, we can't. And so the difference is, and you asked this is, I don't know what the difference is. The difference is if somebody has that kind of allergy, that thing that turns on in their brain where they can't turn it off and they can't stop eating the potato chips and then they try to stop. And now they're think all they're doing is thinking about the potato chips, right? Mm -hmm. It's very it, those two things combined make it very make it very difficult. I think the big difference is when you realize that you have powerlessness over this alcohol. When it took me really until the very end of my drinking, where I was like, mm, I think maybe I can't stop right? I always knew that when I started, I couldn't stop. So I always thought that that was normal until I went into recovery. And it's not. So what happens is you, for me, I had this sense that maybe I was drinking too much, but it was like, I even asked my therapist, my therapist was like, you know what? It's situational. Like going through a divorce, you got a lot going on. Like, don't worry about it. I was probably lying about how much I was drinking. Mm. But it really came to the place where, and I, I just, I literally just woke up one day and whether, you know, it's a spiritual awakening or not, I don't know if this was my main spiritual awakening or not. A lot of people say that it was spirit that comes to them and says, you need help. Mm. I just know I woke up that morning and I was like, I something needs to, something is massively wrong. I am massively broken and I need to do something about it. Thank God I'm one of those types of people who will do something about it. I had postpartum depression about five years, uh, four years before this. And I realized it pretty quick because they told me what the symptoms were. And I was like, I have this, I need help. Take me to the doctor now. Right. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened with this, but it took a long time for me to realize it. So you're right. Before I saw that post on, on Facebook, I knew that I was in trouble. I was actually sitting at home taking quizzes on, uh, you know, Google, like, Hey, am I an alcoholic? Okay. And all, <laughs> so taking all the quizzes online and they're all coming back. Yes. And so it was, I, I knew, I knew that something was wrong. I didn't know what to do about it. My father was also an alcoholic and I realized as well that my life looked a lot like his did at, you know, towards the end. And I was like, okay, this is, I know what this looks like. I always said that wasn't what I, that wasn't the way my drinking looked. And then I, I realized like that morning, like this is what my drinking looks like. And I need, I'm going to need to do something. I don't even know what to do. And thank God that post came that I believe was the universe 
helping me, giving me some sort of a sign saying like, this is, this is what you need. You know, this is what you need now. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about telling my story. I just did a, a TEDx where I tell a little bit more of my story and I'm on a lot of podcasts around, around sobriety because that's not my main job, but I believe that by sharing these things, I can help someone else. I can help someone else who's sitting at home right now going, Oh, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And, and, and I, and then, you know, the isolation and the shame and the fear is so intense at that moment that if I can help share a little bit of light and that there's, there's something at the other, on the other side, then, um, then that, I feel like that's, that's my duty. For, for those individuals that might be listening and thinking, you know, uh oh, you know, something is wrong. First of all, what I got from what you said is that awareness is huge, right? Just having the awareness of it. So that's likely the first step, I would think, is being aware that something's wrong. I don't know if that's correct. Yeah, I think most people who go into recovery are aware that something's wrong. If they're not, then they're not going to have the willingness to get help. If you're not aware of it, and I, I'm going to, I'll say awareness is also willingness, right? Whether you can be aware of it, but you have to be willing to do something about it, right? Mm -hmm. I can be aware that I'm, I don't know, overweight or, you know, but if I'm not willing to change my diet and go to the gym, it's not going to happen, right? I'm not going to lose, I'm not going to get, or I'm not going to get in shape or, and so there's a combination of the awareness and the willingness to, mm -hmm. to do something about it. Right. So awareness and willpower, you have to kind of combine those together a little bit in order to kind of make a difference, right? What? Yeah, but just... willpower is different. Willpower means that I, I am going to will this thing away. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. going to make this go away. Darn it. And willingness is different. Willingness yeah. is being willing to say, I don't know how to fix this. I'm going to go ask someone mm -hmm. else or something else to help me. Right. Okay. Willpower is self-driven and most of us can't get there just on our own steam. We need to have some sort of a spiritual awakening, some sort of other, something outside ourselves to help us because mm -hmm. willpower won't work, but we can have willingness to ask someone else, even if it's just a recovery group or a rehab or whatever it is, ask them for help and be willing to do what they say. I love how you mentioned that because I don't think anyone's ever explained that to me as, as well as you just did. Because I've had people in my life say, Joe, you're so lucky you have the willpower to do this. You have, you're so lucky you have the willpower. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? Everybody's got willpower, but you know what? Maybe we don't. Maybe that's a skill set that I just naturally built over time. So when I start something, I have the willpower to see it through type thing, right? And it seems to be that seems to be something you probably build over time. So I I could see that in the recovery piece of it, um, learning different skills and tools that to help you gain that um, maybe momentum and willpower to continue what you're doing. And that's likely where you're at now. And that's yeah. right. And that's a continuation of things. Whereas willingness is the idea of I'm willing to see I have an issue. I'm willing to say I don't I know how to fix it. I'm willing like so that's that seems very different and I don't think I ever looked at it that way before. Yeah. Yeah, willingness is saying you know and you and I were talking about this before like you have this drive to tell these stories, right? And that drive comes from a few different places, right? It can come from fear. Fear is a great driver. It right? mm -hmm. can be um I never either, I never had that, or I'm so scared that no one's going to like me. So I need to show up, which I don't think is the sense with you. You know, the other is that it is spirit, right? You have tapped in, you have plugged yourself in to spirit, whatever you want to call it. Mm. And that is giving you the power, but you have to have the willingness to show up, right? If you can, you can plug in a, a blender, right? but it won't work until you turn it on. And that's what willingness is, is being willing to say, I'm still going to show up and do this thing. I have a message of what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. I now need to go do something about it. Right. But you have to be willing first before you can have any power. Before, we... before the power can work. 
Yeah, no, and that that makes complete sense. Be, I was going to say before we talk about this this change you made and what and maybe this correlates to what I'm going to ask, but what if you can I don't know if you can answer this. Get, do you know what your very first step was in order to get that help? Like did you reach out to that friend? Did you make a call? Do you, was there something you can recall doing that was that first step or was it a multiple amount of steps getting there? No, no. I mean, the first step was, you know, sitting, waking up on that morning and saying, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I started Googling, like, am I an alcoholic? I mean, I kind of knew. And I was like, well, now what do I, you know, now what do I do? Like, I really had no idea what to do. I didn't know that there were rehabs for alcoholics. My, you know, my, uh, similar to you, my dad was an alcoholic, but never went into recovery. So I never saw it. Um, I guess I knew from TV there were rehabs. I guess I knew from TV there were 12 step meetings. I had no idea what to do. Right. Okay. And so when, yeah, that woman posted on Facebook, I wrote to her immediately and said, I'm in trouble. What do I do? And she said, go to a 12 step meeting. And here's a link for where you can find a meeting. And that was at 12 o'clock. And at 5 30 that day, I went to my first meeting and I've been sober ever since. Wow. Now there's a lot of work, right? You don't just, yeah. it's like going to the gym. You know, you don't just show up and you're like, look, I have a perfect butt. Like that's <laughs> right, that right. works. <laughs> no, but it, it does show that you, you were, you were at that stage that you were willing to make a change in your life. And, it, and you know what I, what I get from it that some people might overlook from what you just said is that you were also willing to reach out to a friend like you reached out before you got the info on the 12 step meeting, before you did all this, you had to, you had to reach out and do that. Right. And not everyone can do that or they don't, they don't feel like they, they don't want to burden people. And it, it, I'm not talking just about alcoholic. I'm talking about anything. Um, we've all, yeah, had but that it's friend. not about burdening people. Burdening people is really fear of being rejected. Right. But you're hiding it under the idea of I don't want to burden you, which is a bunch of crap. Everyone loves helping someone else. Right. It's a fundamental human need of connection. We all want to help someone else. But we say that we don't want to burden you because we're actually afraid of rejection. Mm. Right. Yeah. And that's what I was feeling, too, as I was gonna, that's what I was going to move into is that we have to. We have to learn that it's that it's usually something internally that's causing us to think that way. So so reach out. That would be my thing to anyone out there that's looking for help and anything. Reach out. And, uh, you know, and if there is a rejection, reach out again. I mean, not everyone knows how to handle those situations. So it's nothing to do with you. It's to, you know, it, it's anyways, I just wanted to know before we get into what happened. So you're you're at this place. You you start this and there was a long journey, I'm assuming to get out of this uh, habit you've developed. And um, what, what happened next? Like what was the next yeah. changes that occurred in your life? Yeah. The next big change was um, I started to really do the work. And one of the, the things that I did and it's internal work first, you have to get physically sober, but then there's internal work that needs to happen. And, and there's this, exercise that many people in recovery do called doing a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, um, which is daunting and completely, it totally sucks because many addicts are, most addicts are, we are somehow ill adapted to life, right? We, we, our instincts went awry. We feel like I did a little left of center. We just, we, we kind of don't know how to interact with the world and deal with emotions in a normal kind of way. So what tends to happen is we do one of two things. We get super controlling. So we're going to tell everybody else what they need to do to make me happy because I feel so uncomfortable all the time that only by you, if you just did the dishes right, I could be happy, right? Mm -hmm. If you just made the bed, I could be happy, right? It's those little, even those little things, right? Um, if this president just gets elected, then I'll be happy. Right. Mm. And none of it's going to make you happy. Right. That, that, that's an inside job, but we think it's all this external stuff or so we either become controlling or we become codependent where we say, you know what, I'm going to give 
they're both really the same. I'm going to give all my happiness to you. I, you know, I'm going to let you drive everything because I feel so ill adapted that I'm going to take no control over my own life. And I'm just going to follow what someone else wants me to do or what I think they want me to do. And then you're always chasing something that, you know, you're, you're chasing a target that keeps moving all the time when you do that. And I was a little bit of both. So when you do this inventory, you say, okay, here's all the people that I'm pissed at, right? Here's all the people who have wronged me, right? And here's all the stuff they did. And that feels so good. You're like, yes, someone is finally listening to me about that jerk who wouldn't do the dishwasher right and why I had to divorce him because of it or whatever, (laughs) making light of it. Then you say, what kind of, what, what did that bring up in me, right? Did they bring up fear, um, you know, what, what kind of fears did that bring up in me? And then you have to write down how you participated in it. Hmm. What was your role in that? Right. And that for me, and I actually wrote a chapter in a book that's a, it, it's actually, I'll give it shameless self-promotion. It's an Amazon bestseller hmm. that, talked about this process and it said, do we swear on this podcast? We don't normally, but if it's, a we don't one. normally. Okay. So I'm going to, I'll do the, 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 uh, do the you know, PG abbreviated version. version. So the title of my section is hello, my name is Sherry and I'm a recovering a-hole. <laughs> okay. Love it. And it's <laughs> all about like what I realized in doing that was those people weren't you know, they weren't the jerks, right? They weren't the ones who were making me do these things. If only you would do that, right? I would feel better. That it was my responsibility to take radical responsibility, right? For my own life. But I had to get radically honest first. And they come hand in hand, that radical honesty and that radical responsibility come hand in hand. Because once you're once you're radically honest and you're like, oh, here's how I participated in all this stuff. Then you can also be, you can take radical responsibility for your own actions in your own life. And for me, that was the biggest spiritual awakening because not only did it shift my entire perspective on life, but it also led me to say, okay, spirit, I clearly don't know how to act in this life. Help me to be in this world in the way that you want me to be. Help me to find, in Hinduism, we talk about dharma, right? Help me find my dharma. Help me find the reason I'm here. Help me to to, to support all these other people around me who I've spent my whole life pushing away because the shift was, I believe that I'm here to be of service. And so how can Mm -hmm. I shift all these things that I've been through to now be of service because I believe that that's what spirit put me here to do. But I first had to get, again, radically honest and then take radical responsibility for my own behavior, including saying, okay, on a daily basis, okay, spirit, what do you want from me? What direction should I go in? And that's when you start seeing the synchronicities, right? That's when Mm -hmm. you start saying, oh, I ended up on this podcast or, oh, I met this person or, oh, I opened Facebook when I'm taking quizzes about whether or not I'm an alcoholic and a relative stranger said she was 90 days sober and changed the entire trajectory of my life. Okay. This you, you, you've jumped onto a bunch of different things that I love. So thank you so much. The, uh, the first thing I got from that, again, you said it was really about taking responsibility, but trusting because the trust came, I think the trust came after the responsibility, right? So you had this, you had to kind of come to the conclusion of taking responsibility for some of the things in your life and these types of things. And then, and then to trust that things will work out. I always wondered this and I, you know, again, I, I am the father of, or I'm the son of my father who, um, again, like I mentioned, was an alcoholic mm-hmm. and I have found in my life that I have had, um, times where I have a fear of loss, losing the control of something, whatever that is, you know, if I'm going somewhere, I like to drive. If, um, I don't know if that makes sense. So it's like a control. Oh yeah. Thing. I'm a, I'm Not, a child of an alcoholic. I, yeah. I, I'm, I get you. 
Yeah, it's not like I'm a control freak or anything, as they say that word, but I, I'm not trying to control everything. But there are moments where I catch myself. Am I doing this because I want to have the control of that? Or, and I, and I've been, as I've, as in my own spiritual awakening and my own changes I've been going through, I'm seeing that more and I'm working through that. And it's, it take you have to be humble about it a bit. It, it with someone who's this type of personality and you have these control things, you got to be okay with, with being wrong sometimes. You got to be okay with, letting someone take the wheel sometimes. And I think that that surrounds a lot of what can happen in alcoholism as well. And I, I know that doesn't sound right, but for me, it makes sense. I don't know why that makes sense to me, but um, it, as long as you're drinking, as long as you have that, you're, you're in control. Like you, there's like this feeling of control until you're out of control. Right. And, and that's cliche, but it, it, that, that's the, what I'm getting from this, from what you said. And you can correct me if I'm wrong in that. I wanted yeah. to ask you, I wanted to ask you the name of the book. Because you mentioned you had a book. I wondered if I could get that while we're on it. Yeah, it's called Journey to Your Soul. I'll give oh. you the link if you want to include it in the in the Oh, show. yeah, I'll, I'll definitely you put just, it in your notes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. If you just look me up on, on Amazon, you'll find it. You'll find it as well. Um, I think alcoholics are not... Alcoholics fear so everything so deeply and they they do one of two things they often either control they give up everything and or they drink and mm. drinking is opting out mm. right it looks like it's it's i'm taking control of my own emotions but it's really opting out it's this is all too much for me i i got i got, peace out i'm gonna go okay I got to, I got to go drink, right? It wasn't, you're not taking control of your emotions. You're again, you're opting out. You're opting out of all of it. You're it, it's too much. Your fear of feeling icky all the time. And sometimes you're being pissed that someone else is controlling you or that they won't be controlled by you. Mm. Then you're like, I, this is too much for me. I got to opt out. And that's why we drink. And I think, you know, for you, I, I, I'm a child of an alcoholic too. And we grow up in this environment where you never know often, you never know what you're going to get mm. when you get home. And so, you know, am I going to get happy dad? And some people get like bad dad, you know, bad dad. I didn't have a bad dad. I just had a drunk dad or a happy, you know, or like a present dad, right? I'm very, mm. I'm fortunate in that. Um, but I had a codependent mother who was angry, right? Who you didn't know if you were going to get angry mom, sad mom, you know. And so you just don't know what you're going to get. And and so you you live in that fear all the time of like some the other shoe is going to drop at any minute. Something, something bad is going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. And so, you know, it's a normal reaction to that fear to want to control everything because <laughs> you're like, mm -hmm. okay. I can, if I can just control this situation, then I won't fear, feel so fearful, which doesn't really make any sense. Cause there's probably, there might be probably someone else who's a better driver than you. <laughs> right? That's, that's right. Yeah. And, and, but, but it's this, it's this like instinct to protect yourself gone awry where you're, mm -hmm. because you grew up in a home that was, you know, chaotic all the time. And you're like, if I can just control it. And a lot of us become kind of controlling when we're when we grow up in that environment because we just feel uncomfortable all the time because the other shoe is going to drop at any minute something's going to happen right. i don't know what's going to happen all the time like we're on this constant state of awareness right so it's it's the fear of loss of control it's the fear of not having the control so because mm -hmm. of that we're constantly wanting that con that control that everything to be in place mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and you know, the spiritual awakening is realizing that you have no control. Absolutely, over that's that's exactly it. That's that's exactly what I was because I was trying to think of you know where I'm at in my life and the things I've gone through and the changes I've made. And actually, around fear, I wanted to ask you this: is when you went through these changes, when you were doing the work, when you were getting to where you are now, doing the things you are that you love in your life now, and these things. What when we speak about fear, was there ever a fear of the loss of you, the loss of identity, 
of who you've been. Like, so when you're, when you're, cause you were mentioning you were going through the work, you were, you were taking responsibility and you were doing the internal work to really kind of get to where you were. I just wonder sometimes if a lot, a lot of us, if we are a certain person and we got to do that work, there's this fear of, am I going to come out of this the same person? Have you come out of this the same person? Are you a better person? Has your personality changed? Am I overthinking? <laughs> like that's what no, I'm thinking. It's right such out. a good, it's yeah. such a good, good, great, great question. I I didn't feel like that. I think because I've had enough of a of a spiritual journey before that that I understood that wherever I was was I was there for a reason and that it was meant to kind of help me grow. I didn't necessarily like it. Mm -hmm. Um and I had lost everything, right? I I had I had moved, I had moved across country. Uh I left my business on the other, you know, in New Jersey and I moved to Dallas. And um, you know, my ex-husband kept the house. I was I, I didn't have anything. I mean, I was in an, an apartment literally with like no furniture, few things, uh, no job. I knew I knew no one except for some drinking buddies that I had found because alcoholics find each other no matter where they are. So I had lost so much that I I felt like my I had reached bottom and that no matter what I did it would just always be up, right? And that's un, that is un true of many people who go through this process. A lot of people really grieve the loss of who of who they were, mm -hmm. of what that life was. And and I'll I'll share a little bit of this and I don't think he'd mind. Um my my husband's also in recovery and he was a professional hockey player. And you know, the parties and the girls and the, you know, the lifestyle and the right. And the you just go to a city and they say, here's your keys to your car and here's the keys to your apartment and the fridge is full for you. And you know, everything's sort of handed to you and drinking comes with that. And there, for him, there's a big loss of that life. Right? And that really the loss of it was one of the things that made him drink as well. Right. And so I think for a lot of people, there is that, there is that loss. There, there is this constant feeling of, am I going to be, you know, boring? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not yeah. any fun anymore. I, I realized that I wasn't fun when I was drunk. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then I might, maybe I'd have an option to be more fun without it. Uh, so I was so done by the time I got there that I was like, I, I just help me now. I struggled a lot when it came to my career, cause I had started my own business about four years or so before this, I'd spent a lot of time in the corporate world, had started my own business, had really used it as an opportunity to find out what my personal brand would be. I started, went from a very like logical job doing marketing uh, to one that was very creative. I became a photographer and I'd felt like I'd sort of started coming out of my cocoon a little bit. And so when it came to what am I going to do about my career? What am I going to go back to this business that was so wrapped up in the, in the divorce and the move and just, you know, can I, what is my life going to look like now from a career perspective? That was a very difficult decision. I ended up actually not going back to being an entrepreneur. And, and I think anybody who listening, who's an entrepreneur, I, I like to say that there are seasons and I was an entrepreneur for many years. This happened. I got sober. I, I mean, I kept doing some photography. It wasn't going to be enough to sustain me. Mm -hmm. And I went back to corporate because I needed a little bit of time for someone else to tell me what to do. And I think it's okay to say that you need that sometimes mm -hmm. in your life and say, you know what? I need a regular paycheck. I need someone else to tell me what to do. I need to be able to go home at a regular hour and not work 24-7. And so I think that, yes, that was a real struggle for me was, am I willing to give up this business that I spent a lot of time and effort and that I loved to be in service of what my soul needs right now, which is just a little bit of rest. Mm. And so I went back to the corporate world for three years and then, you know, the COVID happened and the, my phone started ringing and people said, Hey, I'm going to go start my own business. And 
I don't know what to do to mark to, to, in marketing. Can you help me? And next thing I knew, I had this business and I left the corporate world again. And now I think I was ready spiritually and had found enough time to connect where I was saying, okay, you know, spirit, is this what you want me to be doing? Right. And if so, I'm willing and I'm willing to take, and I will take the action, but you're going to have to show me which, where I'm supposed to go. Right. And the phone kept ringing and the next person came and the next podcast came and the next whatever came until the breadcrumbs were so obvious that, that this is where I went. Now I feel that my authenticity and this business are all wrapped up in one, right? I get to have a fully embodied life where it's all one thing, but that takes a lot. That takes a lot of time. One of the things I loved you just shared being an entrepreneur myself and understand, like I understand this life, the 24 seven life, the, the grind and, but then the love for it because you're your own boss, you make your own decisions you get to create something that you created. It's there's power in that. There's beauty in that. The the influence, the impact on people, and the things you can do as an entrepreneur. So I wanted. I just want to take a moment with this because I've met a lot of entrepreneurs over the years, and there's certain personality types that we kind of work out to be like. And then I would say it would it would take a humbling moment to to go back to the corporate world you really to do that you would have really had to have been in that place of i need i need some i need a break i need i need some rest and i don't think there's anything wrong with that i i think the the entrepreneur is always going to be in there and it's going to come back out and cl clearly with you it did um you came back and but you know, for anyone out there that does run your own business and maybe there's maybe you're struggling maybe there's something that you need you know there's nothing wrong with changing it up a little bit but again then there's fear there right there's fear of well i'm my own boss i can't have a boss you know like that's that's crazy what am i what does that mean um and anyway i just want to take that quick moment with that and and mention that i really i think that showcases a lot of how much growth you had to be able to do that i i mean am i wrong in saying that or was that because that is a pretty I don't see that very often in the world of entrepreneurship unless something really goes awry and they need to they need money and they need to jump back in with something if it gets out of control. Yeah, I think I I could have made money if I had gotten my business back moving. The 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 financial dynamics were certainly a consideration. It was very a very different market in Dallas than it was uh in New Jersey right outside New York just from a just the spend is much higher in New Jersey. So that was certainly a consideration. But the big consideration was uh, how do I want to spend my time? And and I'm a I I work with small business owners trying to helping them figure out their just kind of their overall like business growth strategy. And the first thing we start with is why are you doing this? What <laughs> change do you want to make in the world? And how do you want to spend your days? Because I got to the place with my business where I felt like I was going to be running uphill. And the only reason why I was doing it was because my ego was saying, you don't walk away from a business. You don't do, you know, you, you're going to be a failure. Everybody's going to, everyone's going to be disappointed in you. Right. Even though my, my heart knew like one, this business is too tangled up in my, in my divorce and I can't uncouple them in my heart. Like I just, I can't uncouple them. And, you know, I will always be running uphill with, you know, a backpack full of rocks because I can't, I need some space to uncouple these. And I think it's, but my ego, of course, said like, oh, well, you're going to be, you're a failure. You're walking away from your business. And I had to go with my soul's knowing of this isn't serving me. And I can be of better service to the world if I'm not running uphill with a backpack full of rocks mm -hmm. and having trust that the universe is going to tell me where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to do to be of maximum service. 
And that might be entrepreneurship and it might not. Right? And being, again, back to that idea of being radically honest. And then once you're honest with yourself and connects with spirit to tell you what you should do, taking radical responsibility for that and being okay with people saying, oh my God, how could you how could you leave your business? You're so talented or whatever, right? I even hired a life coach who who spent the entire time trying to convince me to continue to continue my photography business. Mm -hmm. And I just knew I just needed a, a rest. And I still do. I mean, I have a two hour shoot this afternoon. I still, I still do it, but uh, it it's about knowing what you need and being willing to tell your ego to shut up. Mm-hmm. And doing what you need to fulfill your soul. Because only when you're really calm and centered and peaceful can you be of maximum service to other people, which is the whole reason why we're here. But And you can't do that if you're running uphill with a backpack full of rocks. You just can't. You cannot be of service to other people. And if that if we believe that that's our, what we're here for, then we have to be willing to take the action to be calm, to be centered even if that looks like a failure on the outside. I love that you work with small businesses and entrepreneurs and things like that. And the interesting thing is the, the things that were coming to my mind as you were explaining this is the insight you had probably from running your own business before then going and working in a you know, regular nine to five, let's just call it that. And then coming back into entrepreneurship, you know, your your business sense or your insight in your own personal growth and who you are and what you need to keep your energy filled may have ch probably changed. I would assume, you know, second time I'm doing this, I'm going to do this a little bit different. And I, and I, I don't, I talk to other entrepreneurs. I talk to other small business owners because I've always been one. I run a music school. I coach clients for music, singing guitar, all these things. I do voice work. I do the podcast. I mean, it's just like 20 different hats. Um, but what I was going to say is there, I'm sure you do this in your work. And I'm just wondering if you can touch on this for any of the entrepreneurs out there, whether they're running a, a photography business, but whatever they're running, how can we build insight into reorganizing who we are as a business owner mm -hmm. without having to leave and come back? Like, I understand that's what you did. But maybe someone out there is like, I don't want to do that. I want to keep, I, I have the love for this business. I still have a love for this, but I'm feeling like something's wrong. Is there any insight? Is there anything you can give, like something you've maybe seen that people can do to kind of re-engage instead of, you know, leaving for two, three years, which is great too. But I'm wondering if there's something else we can do. Yeah. The question for me, when, and I work with a lot of clients who they're either right at the very beginning and they're like, I know I need somebody to tell me what to do because I don't want to take a bunch of, I don't want to Google and try to figure out this whole thing out. Like I just want somebody to tell me what to do to grow this business. And then I do have people who come to me who are sort of in that spot of like, the, I love what I'm doing, but it's just not working. Mm -hmm. And what we do is the same thing we do at the beginning. The people were at the very beginning is we say, okay, Really, let's root in first. So there, I have like three sections that I drive, take people through. One is rooting. The second is service. So who do I want to attract? You know, who do I want to work with? And then the third is attraction. So I don't even do attraction until we've, which is like the marketing plan, right? I don't even do that until we've really rooted in on what are you doing and why are you doing it? Because often something has gone awry, in there, right? There was this idea of, I want to help people who have this challenge, but then we, you know, went, did a course with a well-meaning coach or did something else or fear started to get in the way. And we started offering things that don't really meet our purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I try to diagnose with people is, are you really centered on what you want to do and your superpower? Or are you doing something because you are have fear of, you know, lack? Oh, but I, but everybody, but I have to have a course. I have to have a this. I have to have a that. Mm -hmm. well, who told you that? Right. I don't right. have a course and I make lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, and like, and so I try to uncouple a lot of that because people have these assumptions about how they, what things they have to do that don't serve them. And then they do them and they spend a lot of time doing stuff that does nothing for them because they're not energetically aligned with it. Now, I don't believe that energetic alignment is the only thing, but I believe that that has to be the start. 
Then what people often miss is the second step, which is who do I want to serve and how do I marry who I want to work with and my superpowers with what people actually need? And I find this a lot with, particularly with coaches, is they tend to say, well, this is what people need. And so I'm going to sell that. But people don't know that that's what they need. And so they're not going to buy it right? So I see people often saying like, I'm going to help you work through your, your um, saboteurs so that you can be the effective leader that you want to be. That's great. But how does that person feel right now? Because that's where your marketing needs to be, right? Your marketing needs to be with the entrepreneur who's like, my people won't follow me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I go to work every day feeling like I'm running uphill with a bag with a backpack full of rocks, right? They don't say, oh, I have saboteurs right? or whatever, right? Whatever that that right. thing is, or they don't say, oh, I need to have a spiritual awakening so I can stop drinking, right? Mm-hmm. That's not the problem that they have. The problem they have is they can't stop drinking. So, you know, often we're marketing ourselves in by the result and not by the pain point that people are having right now. So I really spend a lot of time in that of like, where are these people right now? And how can you meet them where they are as opposed to where you want them to get to? Because that shift alone is usually enough to get people back on track, to get their business back on track. Mm -hmm. But they just don't know that that's how they have to communicate. And then we do the marketing plan, right? After that, once we're really aligned on that, the marketing plan gets easy, right? I'm going to, I hate, I hate talking on camera, so I'm not going to do podcasts. I'm not going to do reels, but I can do this or I can do that. That, right there's all sorts of options mm-hmm. did yeah. i answer your question because i feel like maybe no, you I did you, you, yeah, you okay. did i think around number two is where i was really feeling it and and mm-hmm. what what i think it is is re-establishing and i'm going to talk probably a little bit maybe a little bit different from what you said but so sorry if that's the case but re-establishing your your the people you're you're trying to serve re-establishing what they need See, I think what happens with a lot of people when they start a business, it can be any business they have, you said it perfectly in the beginning of this, you, they, they had, um, they have this vision and there's this, 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 uh, issue they want to resolve and they know they're good at it. So you're, they're going to go in and they're just going to come in there like Superman or Superwoman and just fix everyone's issues. And you have this whole ideology and then, you know, a couple of years pass and you're doing it and you're doing it and you're doing it. And I think sometimes it's easy to lose track of who your person is you're serving. And then what happens is you go, well, why am I not getting any clients anymore? Why am I not hearing from it? Well, because now, or maybe, you know, time also changes things. That's the other thing, right? Technology changes, people change, what their need, needs are, they change. And if you're not adjusting to those changes, then you can't find your clients anymore. So, and and then it goes to the point where, you know, it goes more spiritual where, why did I used to have all this work and now I'm getting nothing? Why am I not hearing from this? And you start to kind of question things. So things start to go crazy. So I think what I like what you've done, and I'm I'm interested to find out how people can contact you or work with you is that you kind of bring people through kind of the idea of, you know, why they're doing it in the first place, who it is they're after they're trying to serve, and then how to actually plan a market correctly around that. So it's kind of like a, I, I it's kind of a three-way punch there to kind of get things back on track. But I think the number two, that that area is an area where I think a lot of entrepreneurs need to take a step back and that's getting truth through yourself, understanding who you are And this. It's, it's so interesting that something like what you dealt with early on with the alcoholism and, and things like this holds true to the non-alcoholic as well. Um, if we don't know who we are as well, if we're not being truthful with who we are internally, then we won't know how to serve people correctly. And people can read that. People know this about us. Like you can pretend all you want. You can fake it till you make it. Well, if you fake it and you don't make it and you're just faking the whole time, people are going to, they're going to, they're going to figure that out pretty fast. And then your business is going to reflect, right? Because of it. Does that hold truth to what I'm saying? Yeah. And we, we call it authenticity. Right. I mean, there, there's a huge movement in entrepreneurship on authenticity. And that's what it means to me is this idea of being fully embodied right? Um, in everything you do and everything you say, because I think we try, 
in in personal brand, especially in personal branding, right? We're the face of our brand, which is most of the people that I work with. It's very, we think we have to be a certain thing, right? We think we have to wear the suit or we think we have to wear the whatever, right? We, we, we have, I have to talk like this. I have to act like this. I have to do this, right? And they come in with all these assumptions on what they're supposed to do because they're too afraid of being themselves. And how do I sell that? And a lot of what I work on with people is, especially after we do that initial planning is, okay, well, how do I show up in a way that feels comfortable for me as my real self? Because people buy from people and that's, that's in, and imperfect people buy from imperfect people and people can smell BS a mile away, yeah. but we still think that we have to show up as somebody that we're not because we're too scared to be who we really are. And that doesn't mean you have to, you know, pick your nose or, right on camera. Like Authenticity doesn't mean you have to do stuff. You get to choose what you put out there, but it, it means you, you are who you are, right? I like red glasses. So I wear red glasses. I like pink, you know, but it, it takes a lot of t courage and it takes time just trying different things. Like, Hey, do I like wearing this? Do I like wearing that? Do I like these? Do I like talking this way? Do I like doing video? Do I like doing this? Yeah. Giving yourself the grace to try things, to fail at it, and then go do something else and not feel like you have to come out of the gate being perfect and that you have to be somebody that you're not. Because the more that you are yourself, the better your sales are going to do, which is always so weird to people, but it's totally true. We can't have all of the same person doing the same work. Right. And no, but like, how boring is that? Right. And people do it. And then what happens is there's a couple people who are super successful and then everyone copies them and tries to be them. That's right. And then we have 200 people all who look like, you know, whoever this person. Mm -hmm. And now there's 200 people in the marketplace. The market is saturated and now nobody stands out anymore. And then they're like, why am I not standing out anymore? You're like, well, because everybody stole who you are. And more, mm -hmm. more their own authentic self. There's many things that being human is difficult, but one of the beautiful things about being human is that we're all unique. We're all different mm -hmm. characters in this play. And that's what we enjoy. We enjoy learning about new people. I enjoy every time I do a podcast because I get to learn about the person. In the very beginning, I'm feeling nervous. I don't really know who the person is. It's a different kind of nervous. It's, you know, it's, it's like... Okay, let's see how this goes. But then I get to know the person. We get to kind of move through the energy. You know, I'm a big energy person. So we all want authenticity and we all want that. So if you're a client, if you're someone looking for someone, you're going to look for someone that resonates with you. So be you and your tribe will show up. Your people show up, right? And, I, and that's that's the way I'm looking at this podcast. I'll use that as the general business sense of what I do is that I look at it like the right people will show up and I just trust it. And every time I always feel it's like a confirmation every time I've had a great talk with someone, I'm like, okay, that was exactly what I needed. That's exactly what the people need. That's exactly what we're trying to do. So yeah, I, I just, I, I love that. Where, where do people find you? Can I get that information too? I, I like to put it in the video. So where do people work with you? Yeah, website? thank you. So my website is sherrysutton.com. It's S H E. R R Y S U T T O N dot com. And I'm on all the social places. If you look for Sherry Sutton, for the most part, you'll find me. Um, a lot of it's under your marketing mentor. And yeah, I'd love to chat. If anybody's out there too, I'm just gonna put this out there. If you're struggling with any kind of you know, addiction or not sure what you should be, you know, doing or anything like that, you're welcome to reach out to me. I'm happy to point you in the direction of some resources. I, my, that's how my life was saved. And so happy, happy to, to pass, send, you know, push that forward. What's, what's that term? Hand it forward. Pay it forward. Pay it forward. That's I think that's it. For. I think that's the right thing. Um, I also have a, a TED talk that I did earlier this year. It's called, uh, since you've heard the rest of this podcast, this title won't be surprising, which is how Facebook saved my life and started an authenticity revolution. And that talks a little bit more about what we've talked about uh, today in the podcast. And again, it's a, it's a great resource for anybody who has really struggled with feeling like they don't fit in and feeling like they have to wear masks to, to fit in and, and realizing that they really don't.
and that just being able to embrace our authentic selves. What is the name of the podcast? How Facebook. Oh, uh, my podcast. Well, that was my TED talk is how Facebook saved my life um, and started an authenticity revolution. And then I have a podcast called Bosses with Baggage. And I interview people who have had a dark night of the soul and used it to find a business doing what they love, right? Because I think a lot of people, especially coaches, a lot of entrepreneurs are giving back because they had a struggle, right? I help people find their authenticity in their marketing because I struggled to find my authenticity and got to the place where I hit rock bottom because I just wasn't willing to be who I was because I was so scared. And so now I get to give that back to other people and I help to support uh, people who do that in my, both in my coaching business as well on the podcast again, which is bosses with baggage. And I'm, I'm changing it up a little bit. We were very, um, you know, all the raw details in the last version of that. And I'm changing it up a little bit to be kind of perfectly imperfect entrepreneurs. Cause I think we all are perfectly imperfect. And if we just embrace that, then we have the opportunity to show up as life in a fully embodied way. And there's nothing better than that. I love all that. And yeah, I'm perfectly imperfect or whatever the term was there. I I can attest to that. Uh, I I was going to say, you know, talking about authenticity, as we lead to the end of this conversation, I, I remember when I started this podcast, I told myself I would be authentic throughout it, it, through whoever I talked to. And as we discussed before we started talking, the, the podcast has really gone in direction of near-death experiences, spirituality, and things like that. And I love when I have someone like you on because it gives a little reflection on our – also, we have this reality. We have different layers of reality of what we're going through in life. And one of the authentic, authentic parts of what I wanted to do was to always be asking the same type of questions for my audience, right? And – <laughs> the interesting thing is sometimes I talk to certain people where the, the conversation doesn't really go in a spiritual direction at all. This one does a little bit to a sense, but sometimes they don't. But I always end each episode with this question and um, I'm being authentic. I'm always going to ask it. So I'm curious about your answer to this and you can take a moment to reflect on it or whatnot. But what's the first thing that comes to you when when I say to you, you being you, you know, you being Sherry, me being Joe, like being on this earth why do you think we're here? Service to other people. I, I believe that we are given very specific gifts to help us to continue as a community, the energy that creates the universe. We are we are one little piece of it and we have a role to play. And the only way we understand that role is in community and being of service to other people. And that if we're not using our specific superpower, which we learn by tapping in to our source, then we don't have that opportunity to truly be of service, to truly do what spirit has intended for us, right? And be a part of that overall you know, the matrix, if you will, that we have a role to play in that. And the best way to find it is to be of service to others. I love that. I didn't expect such a spiritual uh, answer. <laughs> it did. I, you know, I didn't know what you were going to say, but being service, I love how you said in community with one another. I think you said something around, around that too, right? And that we all have a role to play. Um. Because a lot of times we get lost with that role and just the biggest thing I got out of this whole conversation was being authentic. Like if I could sum up the whole thing, it would be that you were really trying to find your authentic self and that's where you're at now. Would Is that true? Yeah. And not only finding who I was, but then being willing to show up in the world like that. Mm-hmm. And taking the courage to show up exactly how I am, because I believe that the only way I can truly be of service and live my dharma and live what spirit wants me to is if I show up completely authentically in a fully embodied way in every area of my life. And so not only learning who I am, but having the courage to show up that way so that I 
in every area of my life so that I can be of maximum service in the way that spirit wants me to be. Thank you so much for talking today. I usually take a moment with the audience and just say, thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. Please like, share, and subscribe. I keep trying to spread this message. We get amazing guests like Sherry on. And if you know somebody that this could help, I would encourage you to share this video with them. And whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're someone going through addictions, whether you know someone that's just going through a hard time. So thank you again, Sherry, for being on today. Thank you for having me. Oh